Hi guys, today I spoke to Helen Wilson. She's an applied mathematician and the head of department at UCL. I hope you enjoyed this chat. If you do, please consider subscribing and share it to anyone else who you think may be interested in watching. Thanks very much. Helen, so you were born in Warrington in England. Do you remember the first time that you kind of realised mathematics interests you? No, it was too early. I've always known that, that maths was a key thing for me. Um, I know when I was 11, I knew I wanted to do a maths degree. And I just, I always enjoyed playing the numbers. So no, I, I can't remember a time before I thought the maths was great. <laughs> do you think that people who kind of end up as mathematicians like yourself have a kind of a strong natural ability? How much is it natural ability? How much is it hard work? Some you don't get anywhere without hard work. I'm sure of that. Um, but there's got to be an element of both. Um, yeah, look, looking at the people I was at school with who were good at maths and did other stuff, I think a huge amount of it is what you want. The, the desire to just kind of go and embed yourself in the abstract concepts and all of that is more critical than anything else. You've got to have the ability. It's, it's hard, there's no question. Advanced mathematics is really difficult and if you, if you can't do it, you would struggle. Um, but there's a lot more to it. There's a lot of personality aspects to it as well. So why do you think that mathematics is kind of typically considered one of those really scary subjects at school for a lot of pupils, maybe even the, the scariest one? I don't know. It's kind of self-perpetuating in a way because there are undoubtedly bad teachers and they manage to instill this fear of mathematics into pupils. And they almost certainly got there by having bad teaching themselves and having the fear instilled in them. And I don't know where it started. I guess it's something where in the early days when you're kind of mastering tables and all that kind of stuff. It's very much right or wrong. And so if you are making mistakes, it feels really bad. Whereas when you're doing English, if you can't spell at the beginning, you can still write a really good story and get loads of praise for it with a few little rings around things that you can't spell. And then that'll all develop slowly. If you haven't got the number skills, it all doesn't work. And so I think that's maybe quite dispiriting when you're little, unless it comes to you very quickly. And there are huge differences between people in how fast they develop. So just because you didn't get the number skills really quickly when you were four, doesn't mean you couldn't be an excellent mathematician when you're 16. It's just that you get put off in between. And I think that's, it's a real shame, but you've got to have really inspirational teachers to take pupils past that. And you're only going to get that if they're not scared of maths themselves. It's a, it's a snowball problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw on a few articles that maybe like the key here is that students need to be comfortable with being stuck at like a difficult problem for a while and continuing as opposed to giving up because um, yeah, maybe that's the thing that needs to be encouraged more to truly really stick at it even if you think you're failing because maybe you eventually get there. And, well yeah. that applies across all sorts of subjects though as well. Um, I mean you look at sport, my two children are both very sporty and I, I watch them working at stuff and actually tenacity is almost more important than talent that if you keep on and on and on working, you're never going to be the best in the world if you didn't start out with talent, but you can be an awful lot better than you were. Yeah, maybe there's, um, I don't know if it's yourself that's mentioned it on um, somewhere I've seen online or someone else, but the way that kind of maths is portrayed in, in some movies is kind of the idea of the mathematical genius. And so um, maybe if someone thinks that they haven't instantly got it, they give up. And that's part of it, because you think if I'm not that genius, then I'm never going to get it and we quit quickly, something like this maybe. It's yeah. amazing how many really senior, well-known, well-reputed mathematicians have said to me in casual conversation, oh, but I'm not really clever, I just have to work really hard. There is this perception that everybody else is a genius and actually we're all working like stink to get anywhere because the stuff's just hard. And it doesn't mean we're stupid, but it's very easy to internalize this view that you're stupid. And if that's happening to maths professors, how much worse is it when you're struggling to get a GCSE? Yeah, interesting. Okay, so, so back to you. So after school, you went to study maths at Cambridge. What was that experience like? Oh, that was, that was amazing. Um, that was the first time that I could really stretch with the maths. And yeah, I, I was struggling to understand it as I went along, whereas school maths was all just easy. And socially, it's not quite 
done to be clever and to be seen to be of smarty pants. And once I got to Cambridge, I could stop pretending because I wasn't cleverer than everybody else. I was just struggling along with everybody else so we could all work together. And that was immensely liberating because I could do the very best I could and not stand out and just get on with it. I really enjoyed that. Was it intimidating being around certain students? Now you found yourself you know, not thinking I'm, I'm actually a complete cleverest in the class. Was that kind of inspiring maybe? Um, I think I was protected from it slightly because I went to a small college. I went to Clare College, which is very, very musical, which is where I went there. Why I went there? Because I play the clarinet. I wanted to be in the music scene. I was nowhere near a good enough musician to be part of the Clare College m- music scene, but I didn't know that. Um, but that meant it didn't have a massive tradition in mathematics. It had a good group of students, but there were maybe 12 or 13 of us. And we were kind of doing fine, but none of us was going to come top of anything. Um, Trinity is the place that the really competitive mathematicians go. And I was very lucky, I think, that I didn't go there. I think I would have hated that culture and found it really distressing that everybody was very competitive. And I was kind of not bringing up the rear, but I wasn't in the top two or three people. Whereas at Claret, it was much more we were all working together. It was nice. Do you still play the clar- clarinet now? Sort of, um, occasionally. It's still there. I still get it out and play it now and again, but not in any kind of formal way. Okay, so then you continued at Cambridge to study a PhD, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, your thesis was titled Shear Flow Instabilities in Viscoelastic Fluids. Well done, that's yeah. right. <laughs> um, I've understood the title, but in terms of understanding what it actually is, could you maybe explain in, in simplified terms, if possible, um, sure. what you're so, up to there? Um, a viscoelastic fluid is a, typically a fluid that has polymers in it or some kind of something that can get structure driven by flow. So... Um, The typical example is something like egg white or shampoo. These all have long polymers in, and if you flow them, the polymers tend to get aligned with the flow, and that then gives it like a little bit of stretchiness along the flow. And if you give it the opportunity to release that tension, it might do that, and the energy of that can cause all sorts of things to happen. Shear flows are literally this flow, Um, and they're very common it's the way that you measure fluids a lot of the time, but they also happen a lot when you're processing things. So if you put a fluid through a pipe because you need to get it from one place to another, most of that flow is shear. Um, and so what I was looking at was instabilities caused by the elastic stresses in these fluids in these rather simple flows where there's an interface. So I had two fluids going through a pipe together and a difference between the two fluids would cause something to kick off at the, at the join between the two. So what, um, what led you to, uh, to study in this topic exactly? Um, I was almost random really. I really enjoyed the course taught by John Rallison, who became my supervisor, which was not on this. It was on microhydrodynamics, which was the fluid mechanics at very small scales. So things like flow around cells and swimming bacteria and that kind of thing. I thought all of that was really fascinating and interesting. Um, so I applied to do a PhD with him and the PhD that he was offering wasn't that, it was this, so I did this instead. <laughs> so I entirely chose the person, not the subject. I wanted to ask about like how the mathematics PhD um, goes, maybe as opposed to like a humanities one. I feel like with humanities, it feels like you can set yourself an aim and hopefully not miss the target of achieving like that aim by too long. But in mathematics, can you could you get to a point after a number of years where you're still very far away or maybe thinking it's impossible and you know does that ever get extended your you kind of deadline by a lot of time is it different to other subjects or, or not really in that sense? well I, i've never been in all the other subjects that's the yeah. trouble oh, um yeah. but i think there's a there's a cultural difference between pure mathematics where you're trying to prove theorem d- discover theorems and prove them and applied mathematics where you're typically trying to model a situation i think in applied maths it is much more straightforward that you you try things to solve your problem, but there's always going to be something that gets you somewhere, even if it's just, oh, never mind, we'll stick it on a computer and just solve. Um, They often do overrun, but they don't often overrun massively. So there's, there's always this bit when you're trying to write up the thesis where writing up just takes longer than you think. And so most students overrun by about six months. It's just, it's just life. But it's not that the project isn't coming to an end. It's not that there isn't enough work done. 
it's just that finishing is hard, is hard. Um, but yeah, typically I would say most students get given a small sort of starter problem to just do some calculations on, and then you kind of hone it together with the student. So as a supervisor, you're looking to see which aspects they're strong on, which aspects they're weaker on, focus in the areas where they're stronger, and work out you know some ways that progress can be made on this project using the skills that they have and the skills that they can most easily develop. Yeah, you mentioned applied mathematics. I was going to ask why why you you know chose to be an applied mathematician, but I guess that's just related to your your story a minute ago of you choosing a supervisor who worked in there, and then you've, you've partly that. that way. And actually, I did find that quite a difficult decision to make. So all the way through my undergraduate degree, I took more or less half and half pure and applied courses. Um, and towards the end, I consulted my various supervisors of, of my courses saying, you know, do you think I'm good enough to do a PhD? This is, this is what I think I want to do. Um, and the only person who was honest enough to say, yeah, you're not doing badly, but no, probably not in this field was a pure mathematician. And that kind of helped me tip to the side to go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll flip towards the direction where I seem to have more strength. If you'd gone down the pure mathematics route, were there any areas or topics that you thought would be like most interesting to try and tackle? Oh, I don't know. It's so long ago now. I can't mm. even remember what I was studying. I found algebra kind of groups and, and the structures that build from that fascinating but I also find it found it very hard to get my head around so I think that's maybe something that I should always have kept as a hobby. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about maybe the difference between applied and pure mathematics and I mean are those two, those two are also the, the central two are there any other? There's areas? loads and loads of different branches and there's also loads of bits of mathematics that span the two so as a fluid mechanics person I'm very clearly an applied mathemat mathematician but there are a lot of people working in analysis who sit on the border between the two. So it, it's kind of historically in Britain, they used to be very clearly divided. So the research assessment that happens every seven years or so, if you go back three, there were three different assessments, one for pure maths, one for applied maths, one for statistics. And then they've merged them. And I think that was a real step forward because now we're starting to build the links instead of having silos, we're starting to build the links. So there are some cultural differences so, for instance, in pure mathematics, there are specific journals that are kind of hallowed, that if you can do work that gets in this journal, that's amazing. That doesn't really happen on the applied side. But in the middle, there's a bunch of stuff where it's kind of, you're taking real new mathematics, such as pure mathematicians create, in the context of a real application that really needs it, and so you're doing both at once. So actually, historically, there's been this massive divide. And of course, because I'm you know, approaching 50, I've, I've been around a while, I've got that embedded in me. But I'm seeing people coming through now who are going, well, what is this distinction between the two things? We should all be just one big happy family. And I think that is the future, to be honest. I studied philosophy, so I have to ask you, are there any, you know, this is like topic, uh, philosophy of mathematics, are there any philosophical questions around mathematics or maybe many that like interest oh, you? Oh, there's loads, but... But I find them all really hard. Um, so, I mean, just the question, what is mathematics? I can't, I find myself facing every time I go to do a public engagement thing, you know, we do these talks for school hits and you, you're trying to take your own work and make it accessible to sixth formers. And I always want to show the working. I, I figure that the bit of maths that I enjoy is actually calculating stuff. So I want to take the bit of the actual calculations I do that's nearest to what they can understand and show them that. But I've noticed an awful lot of other people will just show basically the results of their mathematics and not show any of how it gets there. And that leaves me thinking, well, how is that a maths talk? That's just a talk about, you know, making progress in things. It doesn't, it doesn't show you what mathematics has to do with it. But you just tell the students that actually maths is the thing that get, gets you to this. Around all of those questions, you, you have this kind of big woolly question of, well, what is mathematics? Which, which of these bits of research qualifies as mathematics? What do we judge to be mathematical? And what is, you know, where, where's the, the boundary between mathematics and computer science, for instance? It, computer science grew out of mathematics in the first place, um, but mathematics and engineering, it's all, 
you know, what are we? That's <laughs> that's the biggest question, and I don't have a good answer to it. You talked a little bit about you know um, giving talks to students and talked a little about teaching earlier. I mean, what are some what are some effective ways of teaching mathematics that maybe you think you know not a lot of people do? Some kind of techniques or ways of encouraging students. I think with a keen student, easily the best thing is to throw a sufficiently difficult problem and just give them sufficient time to play around with it and, you know, throw in little bits of hints and and tools. That gets the fastest learning if somebody's prepared to work their way through it. But it has to be so perfectly individualised. So in a one-to-one situation, that's exactly what you want. As a parent, that's what I want to be trying with my kids when they're in the frame of mind to listen, which is by no means all of the time. Um, And it's the same experience they get, that you get supervising a PhD student because again it's one-to-one and you can completely tailor what you're doing to that one person. It's rare at any other level of teaching that you can get that one-to-one situation. I suppose if you're doing private tuition. Um, it, Yeah, I, I think it's got to be student-led. All of the really big breakthrough moments are when you're working through something by yourself and suddenly it makes sense. And people can give you a nudge, but nobody can really make you cross that light bulb moment line without you really participating yourself. Okay, so back back to your story a little bit. Just mm-hmm. last thing about Cambridge. I mean, what was like the the postgrad mathematics environment and community like? Was it a very exciting place? I mean, what were was it like to be part of that? Community it was. People? It was really friendly. Um, I mean, mostly we were just a cohort of friends going through, having fun together. Um, going dancing together, you know, just hanging out. Um, Not necessarily talking about our mathematics to each other all that much. It was just, it was a friendly social experience where your day job was to go and try and figure out your PhD problem. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I was unusual in that I did pretty much treat it like a day job. So I, okay, it wasn't nine to five because you know, I was in my early twenties. You don't get, you don't do nine o'clock. Um, it was ten till six, but I would do a regular working day, and I didn't work evenings, and I didn't work weekends, and I had plenty of social stuff going on, and I was definitely happier working like that. So you then went to America, I believe, to do chemical engineering research at University of Colorado Boulder. That's right. Uh, yes. Yes. You, you get up to yeah. That? So I did. I did a postdoc in the chemical engineering department. The work that I was doing would have been applied mathematics if I'd been doing it in Britain. So the disciplinary differences very much depend on where you are. So I was doing fluid mechanics of suspensions, which was kind of the thing I wanted to do when I started my PhD and the thing that my PhD supervisor had done previously but didn't do with me. So I found found somewhere else to do it, started it from scratch. um, And yeah, had quite an effective two years. Um, It was a struggle being so far away from my boyfriend because he didn't get to come over I mean he came to visit of course but he didn't he was he was completing his PhD then um, but I made good friends over there and Boulder's an absolutely beautiful place to spend a couple of years I can't knock it in any way yeah it was it was tough just from being so far away from everyone I wanted to be with but apart from that it was a really enjoyable experience. His PhD wasn't in mathematics as well, was it? I have to ask. No, he was an undergraduate mathematician. That's where I met him, but okay. his PhD was in computer science. Okay. So then you moved back to England, went to Leeds Uni for a few years before coming to UCL? That's right, that yeah. Right? So I got my first yeah. permanent job at Leeds. Um, and my, he was by then my fiance, was in Durham. And then he got a postdoc in, at Imperial. Um, so he was in London and then he got a lectureship at Imperial. So then we both had permanent jobs, but too far apart. So then we started this two body problem process where he was applying for jobs in the north and I was applying for jobs in the south and I happened to win first. So I came here. And then what research were you doing in, in, in UCL for the, for the first few years before you came, became head of department? Um, so uh, continuing the fluids. So I, I then had these two strands, the one of viscoelastic fluids and instabilities and the other of suspension mechanics. And over time, I've continued to work on both of them. And uh, so my most recently graduated PhD student uh, 
no, my re most recently completed PhD student was working on suspensions in viscoelastic fluids, so bringing the two together. The one before that, who is the most recently graduated one, because he's the only one who's actually been through graduation, um, it was back to viscoelastic instabilities in yet another different fluid. So both strands of this are still ongoing, and it's just you build and build and build on the existing knowledge. And then, of course, new experiments happen and you have new modelling that needs to go with that new discoveries are made, people come up with new ways of thinking about things. And you can build your existing experience in with the new knowledge to create better tools, better models, better understanding. All of this research that you're doing in, into fluids, is it a vague boundary between your work as, as a mathematician and what like a physicist would do? Or Absolutely. Is there a quite a clear difference So I've, I've worked like... with physicists, I've worked with engineers, and largely, I would say, I could easily work in a physics department or a chemical engineering department in terms of my research. But the only degree I'd be confident to teach the material on the undergraduate stuff is mathematics. So that's why I want to be in a maths department. If there's anything though that like would separate it, is there anything that would separate like a mathematician or a physicist or um, another scientist working on the fluid stuff? Or is it really no. quite a vague? No, no absolutely really. not. Yeah. So okay. several of my colleagues have worked in physics departments and maths departments and consider themselves to be absolutely just on the boundary. There are slight kind of differences of style in how you present things, but they're so subtle. Um, so you can sort of tell whether someone you're talking to has come from a physics background or a maths background, but we can all talk to each other and we're all doing the same stuff. What are maybe one of those, one some of those subtleties that may give it away, are they maybe quite hard to Yeah, put so <laughs> um, it, it's phrasing of how you so one of the key things that you do when you get a new set of equations is to make them dimensionless, which means that you can say, OK, all my masses, I'm going to scale with the mass of this object and all my lengths, I'm going to scale with the width of my channel and all my speeds, I'm going to scale with the speed at the center line of the channel, something like that. And if you do that, you take out a bunch of variables and you end up with maybe only one or two governing parameters that you need to vary to see what all the different behaviours are instead of five or six. So it's really powerful in terms of reducing the search space for where your phenomena could happen. So it's a really common tool across all the physical sciences. Um, the way that that's expressed by a mathematician, you would say, oh, we non-dimensionalise using these time scales. We would usually write down all the equations dimensional, express all the scalings, write them all down dimensionless, pull out the combinations of things that give you a dimensionless number and then explain what those do. I've noticed a physicist will just say, oh, we work in a scale in which time is one and speed is one and length is one. <laughs> That's it. And it all means the same thing. But the first time you see it, if you've been brought up the other way, you're going, what on earth are they doing here? Can you explain that? Um, I did, I'll be honest, I didn't quite get the dimensionless idea. So what, what was that? So, um, for example, let me take a really simple situation, that which I teach in the first year. Um, if you've got a sphere, I tend to think of an igloo, and an object sliding down it, so I have a pen penguin sliding down my igloo, um, and there's no friction, it's just sliding. At some point it gets going fast enough that it will leave the surface and just fly. I mean, not fly, but think it can sure. fly. Okay. Um, You've got various things there. You've got the gravitational force, you've got the mass of the penguin, you've got the radius of the igloo. But actually, that's all you've got. So you've only got one mass scale, you've only got one length scale. And gravity, combined with your length scale, gives you only one time scale. So actually, there's only one thing going on here. And if you solve it, you will discover that the height at which the penguin leaves the top of the igloo the angle that it's gone through is the same regardless of what gravity is, or the mass of the penguin, or the size of the igloo. It's always the same angle because, because if you do it dimensionless, there aren't any parameters left. Mm. So you've got to always get the same answer. Okay, interesting. Um, I mean, some of this research you've done, like, has much, much of it been put into any kind of practical applications, you know, for engineers or, or anything like this? Some of the stuff you've discovered about fluids and how they work? And... I'm a little bit further back than that so more at the theoretical end. I don't think I've done anything that's gone into direct application, but the understanding that we're developing in things like, we've got models for 
the way that cornstarch jams um, and the different flows, the way it responds to different flows and, and whether some of them will unjam it or not. If we can get those better, those will go into numerical simulations that will definitely drive industrial processes and improvements. But it's all still in the future at the moment. <laughs> Okay, and so then after a few years after coming to UCL, you became the, the first ever female head of the department, is that right? I did, yeah. yes. Quite a few years after, I yeah. think. So I started in 2018 and I've been here since 2004. So, okay. yeah. so I, I, I was an ordinary member of staff for a good while before okay. taking the plunge. For like, what, about 10 years did you say? Or for um, how many so years before? I came in 2004, so I'd yeah. been, I'd been here for 14 years. Okay, 14, yeah, that's yeah. true. And what's it been like as head of the department? Very full on. Um, Because, of course, we've had a pandemic, you might have noticed. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Without that, it probably would have been okay. (laughs) Um, I don't think I would recommend being head of department through a pandemic. Then then hopefully we won't need any more of those. Um, Yeah, we're a big department and we've grown a lot on my watch as well. Um, It almost feels like too many people to manage. So we, we now have, including everybody, around 100 staff. Um, yeah. And they're not all my direct reports, but I'm, I'm the line manager at the end for all of those people. And I didn't really have a whole lot of management experience when I started. So obviously I've picked up quite a lot now, but it's fairly intense picking it up from, from no start. Um, it's a very odd job because you've got the people management, which is very kind of micro scale almost at the same time as the big strategic pieces of where the strategy, where, where the teaching strategy should be going, where the research strategy should be going, what your hiring strategy should be, all of those things. Um, the context switching, I've found, is a struggle. Um, I quite like the managing individuals side of it. I'm less comfortable with the big strategy, but I guess everybody has areas they prefer. Um, And then you get bursts of really intense activity. So we we renewed our Athena Swan award. We we have a silver award for gender diversity. And that's a big piece of work, which kind of happened in the middle of homeschool and all the rest of it. (laughs) That wasn't much fun. But on the other hand, doing it and doing it well does feel really good. Um, And it's really nice to have seen the department safely through a hard time as well. So we had various difficulties with, I mean, obviously we had to take all our teaching online. We all had to learn how to make video lectures at home and all of that kind of stuff. But also when the uh, A-level grades came out in summer 2020, and then there was this backtrack over whether we were going to use teacher assessed grades. We ended up with an intake in the first year that was twice as big as it would normally have been. So managing that, hiring extra people just to cover all of the small group teaching, that was a really big effort. And we managed it and the students seem reasonably satisfied, although I think they'll be happier once they get back to fully face-to-face lectures next year. Nobody quit in disgust, you know, it was, <laughs> by and large, we got through it. Yeah. And I think we provided a pretty good education as best we could within the horrible constraints that we were facing. You mentioned the strategy. So is there much thinking about what new topics of maths you should be teaching, what you should be adjusting based on like what trends yeah, around so the world? Or on, on the research like? side, I would say we don't do very much of that. We tend to go for just hire really good people and trust them to do the right research. But on the education side, yes, absolutely. We need to be making sure that we're teaching what is needed. And we are, it's a slow process to spot what needs to be done and then to create the right materials and get the courses running. So we probably don't do that as nimbly as we should, but we're in the process of working on new courses for the fundamentals of machine learning, that kind of thing, all of which are mathematics and aren't necessarily obviously mathematics until you go looking. So we should be teaching those so that all of our maths graduates go out going, oh, look, this this machine learning stuff, it's all very cool, but look, it's just standing on this core of fundamental, relatively straightforward mathematics that you need to understand if you're going to know what's coming out of your black box. 
So you're looking at what, what's maybe changing in the technology space and things like this to maybe inform what you teach. Yes, exactly yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Any other things you've added or hoping to add, you know, apart from machine learning? Um, well, we've, we've been looking at the skills that our students need on the way out. So it's important that they do some group work so that they have those skills, even though typically they don't much enjoy doing the group work because it's, it's not easy and you have to learn all these other skills. Um, so we've introduced group working. Uh, we've introduced programming in the last decade, which I think we were a bit behind the curve on that, but we now have a variety of, there's some compulsory and then there are some optional programming and, and numerical methods courses further up the degree for those who were really interested in that kind of, that side of things. So are you able to do any teaching or research at the moment in the last few years or are you pretty much? So I really, on? really like teaching. Yeah. Um, so I could, as head of department, absolutely go, no, I'm not going to teach, I don't have time but I would miss it so much. So I have been teaching half of first year module the whole time that I've been head. And that's really nice. It's only five weeks, so it's completely manageable, but I do like to see them and to just feel engaged with the department. I think I would feel so isolated, especially with the lockdowns. Mm. I would feel so isolated if I didn't have something to do with the students. Um, research is harder. Um, I haven't really done any research that's not with a junior researcher since I've been head. But I've been lucky that I, I had a grant joint with UCL Engineering when I started as head, which has only recently finished. So I had a postdoc for the first couple of years and I had a PhD student also associated with that grant, as well as one finishing up who was from, from earlier who came with his own funding. And then this last September, I've started two new PhD students. So I'm not really doing any research that isn't them because new PhD students take a quite a lot of oversight. But that does mean that it keeps me linked in with the community. It's a reason to go to conferences. It's, it kind of, it keeps me on my toes. It means that I won't be just a research desert when I stop and I'll be able to get back in the groove and, and carry on from where I left off, basically. What do you enjoy about teaching? Oh, a bit of it is just the showman thing of standing in front of a group and, and showing off and doing the thing, having a performance. Yeah. I like the adrenaline buzz. Mm. But also I really enjoy the moment when they understand. So I like small group teaching as well. The, just the ability to take someone who has not quite understood, drill down, figure out what it is that they've got a slight misconception over, fix it and see how all the other bits just fall into place. That's just awesome. Last question I ask you about your research is, I mean, I have to ask you about the chocolate fountain research you did with uh, one, one student, because that kind of um, brought with it quite a bit of public interest. I've a did. few articles about that online. Can you say a bit about what that project involved? And, yeah, so that yeah. was actually an undergraduate project. Um, Adam Townsend uh, did his fourth year project with me back in 2012. Um, and yeah, it was just it was just a fun idea. It didn't have to go anywhere. It didn't have to be proper research because fourth year projects are just about exploring some mathematics. So I, I'd seen a chocolate fountain and I, I wondered why the chocolate didn't fall straight down at the edges and why it falls inwards. Um, and I just thought, oh, there's some really nice small mathematical fluid modeling here. Let's have a go at it. And he obviously thought that was a really good idea because he was going to get chocolate as well. <laughs> um, and yeah, it went superbly well. He was a very strong student. So I then took him on as a PhD student, did something completely unrelated for four years. Um, and he's now a lecturer at Durham. So that hallmark of a good student. <laughs> um, but after, I think it was three years later, I'd never thought about publishing it because it wasn't really cutting edge research. You wouldn't put it in a normal research journal. And somebody just, I happened to mention it at a conference and somebody said, oh, do you know about European Journal, European Journal of Physics B? They published this sort of thing. I went, oh, well, I'd never heard of them and I didn't know that it existed, but that's great. So then we wrote it up just because of this one-off conversation. And they turned out to have a really good idea about how to market papers, which are quite fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were on the radio and in First News, which has a readership of two million kids around the country. And <laughs> yes, the splash was huge. That's nice. nice. Do you think that, um, do you think mathematicians should maybe try to tackle a few more, 
you know, like everyday fun ideas like this to maybe attract some interest or is that a, Oh, it's a vexed really question, a that one. Yeah. I mean, the chocolate fountain was fine because it was a, it was a decent project. It, it, we weren't doing silly things just for the just for the noise. The noise was a side effect of us doing a perfectly sensible fourth year project. But you do get these... And another example of that is um, the mathematics of skimming stones. Again, that's, that's properly hard fluid mechanics. And Professor Frank Smith in this department has worked on it. But occasionally you get silly stories about it and that's quite fun. But we get contacted by people going, oh, can you write the formula for the perfect smile or something? And I think, really? you just don't want to touch that sort of fake maths because it, it does you no good in terms of your reputation within the discipline. And actually, it does mathematics no good in the outside world if people look at this stuff and go, but that doesn't make any sense. Whereas, yeah, making a nice story out of something that really did have some decent mathematics underneath it, yeah, of course, absolutely go for it. But I think we need to stay short of media for media's sake so uh, how has like a life in mathematics helped i mean have the skills that you've developed as a mathematician helped you much outside of your career the way you think or you know well that's really difficult to know isn't it because i have the skills i have and i <laughs> i think the way i think so, yeah, i think yeah. i would always have thought like this i mean my dad was an accountant my, my brother was an accountant it, we're numbersy people um and being numerate and having that kind of logical mindset definitely helps with everything, but I probably would have had that anyway. Are you very interested in, well, it's probably a silly question. I mean, I was going to ask you how interested you are in science, but like, as you say, it's so tied up in what you do. I mean, is, there, apart from you know, fluids and maths and physics, are there any other disciplines or subjects you're really into? Maybe they're not even related, maybe you're really into history or something else. I mean, do you have many interests elsewhere? I don't tend to go for academic subjects for my outside interests. Actually, I'm not. I'm not someone who reads about astronomy and that kind of thing. I, if anything, I I find the scale of the universe slightly depressing, so I try not to think about it. Um, I sort of feel like I've done enough maths and science by the time I come home, and I want. I just want to play. So, um, I'll play the piano. I'll play with the kids. I, endlessly scoring cricket matches at this this time of year, um, and all of that gives me lots of pleasure. Are your kids getting interested in mathematics? Not yet. Not really. Um, I mean, they're, they're only junior school, beginning of senior school age. They're obviously doing it all the time. Um, I think my son might get interested, maybe. But at the moment, he's really liking his science. And that's, that's cool. And sufficient mathematics to fuel being able to do the science, I think, is all he's really interested in. My daughter is just all about sport and art at the moment, so we'll see. <laughs> mm, what did you say a minute ago about the the scale of the universe you find depressing? What was it? What did you say a second ago? Well, thinking Sorry, about like yeah. just just the the size of the universe, the galaxies, the yeah, heat death of the universe, black holes, all of that stuff. I just I don't handle that particularly emotionally. I would rather snuggle down into the <laughs> in, into the the comfy grass, as they put it in Sophie's world, and just not think about the fact that you know we're all going to die and that kind of stuff i no let's just get on with enjoying the fact that the sun's out yeah sure so you stay away from these existential risk books which are popping up all the time now and yes you know, have, yeah. yes that does not suit me at all if i need if i'm going to function i need to just put that out of my mind and get on with the day <laughs> have you had any mathematical heroes that have really inspired you throughout your career a little bit um and not so much heroes as role models, I think. I, I, don't, I don't believe in this great genius kind of stereotype at all. But I've looked back and realised that I've been affected by people earlier when I didn't particularly clock it. So um, Susan Brown was a professor in this department when I arrived. She was a, a year or two from retirement when I arrived as a junior lecturer. And I took over a course that she had taught and I had her lecture notes and she was very friendly. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I realised that just having a really senior woman about the place, not making a fuss, not being overtly feminist, not doing any of that stuff, but just quietly doing the job really well and being nice and being ordinary, made me think, oh yeah, I could do that. That's fine. That's it. I don't have to be breaking ceilings. I'm just doing what Susan did, just, you know, 40 years later. That's fine. 
What um what 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 is exciting about doing mathematics? Is it solving the problem? Is it being stuck in that bit before you solve it? And you know, it's, you don't know where it's going to go. I mean, yeah. What is it you think that captures your imagination? If you it's put the, that it's words? the moment between the two. Okay. It's mm-hmm. where you get from the stuck to the oh, hang on. If I do this, this might just and then actually, I do really enjoy in a very mechanical way the actual calculation of when you you're pushing it all through. But that's that's very much the same joy as getting your bank statement to balance or something like that is it it's a it's a crossword kind of kind of pleasure um but the moment when you realize what calculation you could try that's the big buzz that's what it's all about and then obviously if it works that's lovely but it's the moment where you first get the glimmer of it that's the real shining prize are you sometimes stuck you know in that intermediary phase for when you're doing research for you know days and weeks before you can kind of see the next step Yes, less so now because there's so much else to do that if something gets that stuck, I end up just getting suckered back into head of department mm-hmm. stuff. But yes, when I when I had more time for research, that was definitely true. Even then, the subconscious is great. So I've never had the tenacity to sit staring at a stuck thing for more than about a day. It's just too frustrating. So I would always go off. There's always more than one strand going on in your research. I'd always just go off and work on another one at that point. But your subconscious is ticking away. And then a few weeks later, you go, oh, hang on. Maybe if I come back over here and have a go at this, and then you're off again. And that's really nice. So ideas are like pop into your head at those moments you're in the shower or something like that. Does that mm. happen? Well, three o'clock yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> really. Have you ever woke up in the night with... with uh... Say three o'clock in the morning. Was that when you were wake working, or was that no, you were waking I, up in the no, night? Yeah, no, I was thinking yeah. of waking up in the middle of the night. No, yeah. if I wake up in the middle of the night with mathematics in my head, it's always rubbish. Oh, okay. When I check it in the in the morning. <laughs> but you sometimes do. You sometimes wake up thinking there's an yeah. idea and yeah. check it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask as well. Like, are there any things you know? We talked about how mathematics may be helpful outside of your career. That are there any things that mathematics is 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 particularly useful for that you think? that people wouldn't expect it to be. I mean, like you say, it's hard for you to know exactly how it's helped your life, but like what ways are mathematics maybe understood, mis- misunderstood, sorry, and potentially helpful, um, but yeah, people don't really know about it. Anyways. I think people don't understand just how much of how all of the modern technology works is built on the fundamentals of mathematics. And that's not my mathematics in my day-to-day life, it's, it's all historical mathematics that's gone into that, but yeah, people often have this attitude of, well, you know, it's almost true. I don't need to know mathematics because I have all of these tools that can just do it for me. But actually, a lot of, if we want the next generation of the tools, <clears throat> then we need at least some of the population, and probably quite a lot of the population, to understand all the mathematics to go on and build. So having a really numerate workforce is, I don't mean numerate, I mean mathematically literate workforce is so important. Are you quite interested in technology, like kind of generally as a... I'm a user, I'm a user user rather than a developer. Yeah, sure. Is there there any research that you're excited to work on in the future? Maybe if you at one point in a finish had been head of department after a number of years and go back, are you planning to do that? Do you want to do that? Yes, so it's it's a five year term and I've... um, done three and a half so I can see okay. the light at the end of the yeah. tunnel and yes I absolutely intend to go back to being a normal maths professor who does research does teaching just gets on with an ordinary academic life um, <clears throat> the pain of being head of department is that I haven't got the perspective now on what research I want to do so there's a year after being head where I will have a sabbatical year and I'll be able to just take the time to to look into research, go to conferences, read. I'm not up with literature anymore. Read what's going on, find out and see where I think my next contribution could be. So right now, no, I don't have that vision at all, but I have the longing for that vision and a pathway to get to it. Will this be in like fluid research or maybe some brand new area, I guess? Oh, it's almost certainly gonna be fluid mechanics because I've got so much expertise there. But having said that, I've got one of my PhD students is working on something that's a little bit different. So it's got some fluid mechanics in, but it's got a, a lot of just particle interactions. So it's going to be physical research on materials moving around for sure. But there's always 
little bits at the edges. You can you can branch out a little way, but I'm not going to start an entirely new direction. Well, I think that's most of the stuff I wanted to ask you, really. So thanks a lot for speaking. It's great okay. to hear about your story and, you know, best of luck in the final year and a half of Head of Department and Research After. Thank you very much. It's been nice and nice talking to you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you enjoyed the Human Podcast, please consider subscribing. I hope to see you soon.